Chapter 3 in Stephanie Lawson's text on international relations summarizes the main theoretical influences at work in research in the field of IR today. The field has expanded greatly throughout its short lifespan as an academic discipline, and the purpose of this presentation is to explore that evolution in brief. Theory is an important part of any discipline, but it functions in a couple of very different ways. In one sense, when we say we are theorizing or utilizing theory in IR, we mean a hard, data-driven approach, using the reasoning of positivism. This means that we are attempting to falsify instead of prove our theories, thus creating a very high standard of proof, and deductivism, meaning that we draw from existing theory and compare new, to, new data points to see if we can disprove the theory. This is different than the inductive approach, which consists of collecting data and more or less waiting and seeing what types of theories we can make about the data. This is still science, but it does not carry the same evidentiary standards as deductivism. What we mean by theory in the larger sense is an explanation, a simplification of the way the world works. The grand theories we discuss in political science contain notes of empiricism, but they are largely normative in nature, meaning that they confront questions related to human rights and the right type of government. In IR, more than any other field in the discipline, these normative elements persist due to the subject matter of human suffering and war. It is important to remember that in science, theories are not true in the sense that we tend to think of evidence like a court of law. Rather, theories generate ideas that we test with data in order to accumulate enough knowledge through the years to hopefully arrive at laws of the universe. To date, few such laws exist in the physical world, and none exist for the social world. Instead of laws, we have paradigms, competing, competing visions of the mechanics of the world, that engage in a dialogue about theoretical causes of phenomena in international relations. These are liberalism and realism. The way that theory works in international relations, however, is that we are rarely testing these two paradigms against each other, but rather testing hypotheses about more specific events, and these hypotheses are drawn from the perspectives offered by these two competing visions. We begin with liberalism in the 20th century, even though the roots of these theories extend back to ancient times. Woodrow Wilson was an important figure in the creation of international relations as a field due to his role in post-World War I America. Wilson believed in the power of the democratic peace as a mean to end world wars, drawing from Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant, who argued that certain forms of government would be more peaceful, like democracies. The original fanfare over democracies not fighting was disproven by empirical data, and democracies do fight wars just as often as autocracies. They just tend to fight autocracies instead of other democracies. Bueno de Mosquito wrote in the 90s that the dual impact of democratic states having large winning coalitions at home meant that democracies were more constrained from engaging in wars that they might lose, whereas autocracies, who have to please a much smaller circle of people to remain in power, can engage without having to make the same calculations. In general, these ideas about democratic countries not fighting each other moved many policymakers and thinkers to argue that spreading democracy could greatly inhibit the likelihood of war. A central part of liberal beliefs is that individuals are capable of self-determination and self-rule, and that the role of any government should be to protect that capability. Liberalism also coincides coincides with a greater demand for the nation-state, both for the purposes of commerce and for more independent forms of governance. The possibilities for peace are the main concern of liberals, and they believe that self-regarding actions of individuals can lead to better outcomes for all, which is why rational individuals would create institutions and rules to consent to be ruled by in order to achieve peace. Another strong component of the liberal philosophy carries with it the classical liberal philosophy from the Enlightenment, and that is economic freedom, which at the international level entails few restrictions on trade between countries and open markets, little government intervention, and opposition to authoritarian rule. Because prior to capitalism, monarchs and the crown controlled all wealth, and liberals were suspicious of this form of rule for economic as well as personal freedom. But it must be noted that classical liberals were fairly preoccupied with economic freedom over personal liberty. Modern realism has its roots in ancient Greek philosophy, but faced a strong revival in the 1940s in response to the perceived failures of liberalism to prevent World War II. The institutionalist period prior had seen the failure of international institutions when Hitler withdrew from the League of Nations in 1933. This institution had been established by the Treaty of Versailles under the guidance of Woodrow Wilson after the end of World War I. 
because it is mainly a response to what is, it sees as failures to liberalism, there is no single coherent realist theory, but instead there are branches of realist theory based on a few common assumptions. These assumptions are that states are unitary, rational actors, and are in constant competition for power and security, which leads to a fearfulness of every actor, and there is anarchy in the international system. Anarchy meaning a lack of government. Theories vary according to which of these characteristics they highlight the most. Hans Morgenthau, an early classical realist, argued that the principal feature of the world system was power. Because states constantly seek power to protect their own safety, they would make decisions not based on what was morally right, but what kept them in power. This was so humans, as Morgenthau saw them, were self-centered, rational actors who were self-maximizing, expending the least energy necessary to achieve achieve the greatest end result, and he conceptualized states as having the same characteristics. Later realists would argue that the structure of the international system is actually the cause of war and other events. The lack of authority to prevent war or anarchy is the important feature there. Most realists also register the same complaints against liberals. This includes an objection to liberals' view of state behavior as cooperative through institutions. In other words, they think liberals do not understand state motivations, that states who seek power would be compelled to violate these rules. In addition, states should not, in their own interest, form institutions that assist other states through free trade, because helping other states get wealthy could backfire. This is due to the fact that power is fungible, meaning that power in one area, like the economy, can be transferred to another area, like the military. In response to these criticism, a new generation of neoliberals introduced some modifications to their theories, arguing that realists were too centered on states, failing to realize the influence of other types of actors in the world. In addition, they saw the world stage as a pluralistic one, where competing visions of the world were negotiated until consensus could be formed. Neoliberals also argued that states were interdependent on each other, and the more interdependent the better, because that would give them incentives not to harm each other. This meme, by the way, is just kind of a bad meme. There's really not much of a point to it. In response to the new generation of liberals, neorealists responded. For example, Kenneth Waltz argued that many theorists, realists, and liberals alike had improperly conceptualized the structure of the international system. For Waltz, the problem lay in what images of politics people relied on to explain international relations. These three images were human nature, internal or domestic organization of states, and the international system of anarchy, or lack of government. Many theories failed, he said, because they used the wrong image, trying to explain what is happening by looking at how individuals act is incorrect, because states are not people but a specific type of entity, and to understand the system you cannot look at only one state or any peculiarities of the state, but instead look at their environment, the international system, because that is what truly shapes their behavior. In other words, states did not seek power because it pleased them, but because they had to. And the reason they had to was that the international structure was anarchic, leaving states vulnerable to the power hunger of other states. All realism has in common the preoccupation with power and the fear over cooperation and diplomacy. For this real reason, realists see war as inevitable and peace as unlikely. Several branches of theory refute the claims of liberalism without agreeing with the anarchy proposition of realism. For example, Marxist theories and their offshoots see liberalism as a failure, largely because of the justification of exploitation of cheap labor, which is built into liberalism, but they also do not assert that states are anarchic. They see a pretty firm type of world order that is formed by rich countries in the world system, even while they agree with the power assumptions of realism. Marx and Engels were largely writers about domestic circumstances that led to the exploitation of the proletariat class by the bourgeoisie, but they did offer some perspective for later Marxian writers to draw from, related to the colonization of Asian and American peoples and the expansion of industry based off of these exploits. World systems theory draws from Marxism by focusing on the exploitative nature of the capitalist system, and the major contributors to this theory are Vladimir Lenin and Samuel Wallerstein. 
as well as others. Lenin conceptualized an imperial form of capitalism that drew on previous periods of colonization to maintain the subjugation of impoverished former colonies through trade agreements and other financial entanglements. From these theorists' standpoint, there's only one world system, that is the capitalist system, and it operates by extracting raw materials from the periphery countries, the poor, man manufacturing them into value-added products, and selling them back to the periphery. In addition, some countries might enter into a type of semi-periphery status. These are middle-income countries from which some raw materials may be extracted and turned into products that are sold back to them, but they might also exist as a form of middleman in the production chain, receiving raw materials to manufacture and sell to both the core and the periphery, positioning somewhat better in the world system. An example of a semi-periphery country would be Mexico. They send raw materials like agricultural goods to developed countries, but they also are a middle manufacturing point for car parts. So they receive lesser assembled parts, they do some manufacturing to them and send those parts to the United States for their final assembly and sale in the United States. In addition to importing raw materials from other countries and selling things back to them. Gramsci was an Italian writer who was imprisoned as a communist under Mussolini's fascist government, so he is sort of the original anti-fascist. He argued that the liberal assumption was wrong, that institutions could promote peace and prosperity. He said that instead, these institutions constituted a form of manufactured consent that really didn't exist, and it was done by elites to get working class voters to vote for their positions at home and abroad. From this standpoint, the connections between elites across international lines matters a lot, and the international organizations more or less serve to maintain them as a form of hegemonic ruse. The structure of international organizations, for example, could make it obvious why these institutions were created and who they actually served. So these institutions were really just ways to manufacture consent from poor people in poor countries while making it seem like it was simply just the cultural acceptance of capitalism. Other Marxist schools, like the Frankfurt School and Habermas, relate to the importance of social and cultural factors in addition to economic hegemony. For example, Habermas's work focused on the role of cross-cultural social movements and forces that could attempt to draw attention and bring about change to the unfair social conditions around the world. This would often take the form of international organization work, he said. He did not always believe, like, unlike Gramsci, that international organizations were negative. He said that they could be used to form networks of human rights protection. In general, most Marxists reject the strict positivist view that, that positivism is the only way to do science. It also has opposed the structure of the world as natural or immutable. Um, and also moves beyond economics and class inequality to focus on new forms of community that challenge exclusionary practices. And for some of the new Marxists, the state is one of those exclusionary practices in and of itself. Marxism is a form of critical theory, and it does form the basis of critical theory, but critical theory now includes as well a number of emancipatory philosophies that have also made their way into international relations. The important thing to remember is that critical theory questions the power structures and seeks to emancipate oppressed people. One such school of thought is the English school and its offshoots of constructivism, which are beginning to be influential in the U.S. as well. The English school represents less of a positivist preoccupation with hard data and deductivism and finds fault with the assumption of the primacy of states as the only actors of concern in the world system. They argue that it is impossible to be purely positivistic, non-normative, because there are important normative expectations that states have of one another, and therefore exploration of the right form of government, the right form of agreement, can and should be scientific. This normative element of behavioral expectations among states forms a type of world order, they say. So there is not anarchy in the way realists assert. 
There are two strands of this line of thought in the English school, which views the international environment as a form of society. There's one that argues there are few cultural areas of agreement and therefore institutions should form around those that already exist. This is the pluralist approach. And one that argues that states should work toward a collective will and increase the areas of agreement to in increase the amount of human rights in the world. This is the solidarist approach. Constructivism is an early 20th century viewpoint that has made a comeback recently. Essentially, the ideas of the English school of world order are relevant here. Social institutions emerge and are relevant because they are constructed by our institutions. This is not just international institutions, but most of what we view as naturally occurring reality. But we are actually in charge of reality because we are creating it, we are constructing it as a collective. And so mindfulness and cooperation, according to constructivists, could lead to something better. From the constructivist standpoint, rulemaking is not a standalone reality, authoritative of its own right. It is a process that is influenced by human understanding and interaction. All rules are ideational construct. They can be changed by human agency, even if not easily. So some forms of reality are objective, Physical reality is not questioned by constructivism, but our meaning of it, according to constructivists, could and should change. As relates to international relations, states' identities are formed by interactions between other states and their own behavior. This is a form of order that violates the realis realist expectations, where states should be all the same. They should all be dangerous, afraid, and belligerent, because we all know what motivates other states, fear and power. But social interactions in the international realm actually matter. This is the reason why we do not object to the UK having nuclear weapons, but we do object to North Korea having them. We have a history with both of these countries. Another form of critical theory is feminism and gender theory, and it has some things in common with constructivism as well. The general belief is that women's roles in life are not natural, but a result of social convention around gender roles. There are ongoing arguments about what constitutes feminism and who is a feminist and what issues should be included in feminism and when women and men are not in agreement around the world over this. And feminism actually means things to different cultures. In general, it is a study concerned with the social role of women in relation to men that is animated by a conviction that women suffer injustices because of their sex. There are multiple waves of feminism. When you hear of the second wave, most often you're hearing about the reemergence of feminism in the 1960s and 70s, and the first was the suffragette movement in the 19th and 20th centuries. The third wave of feminism emerges, depending on who you ask, somewhere between the 90s and 2000, and becomes more inclusive of different sexualities, observes some previous uh, oversights like women of color, and their theorizing and attempts to make it less of a middle-class white women's movement. The third wave, or maybe even the fourth wave, has grown in recent decades to concern itself with the ways that gender constructs harm men as well. Uh, they also take into account the environment and women in other countries. And so in that sense, it has become more of a global type of feminism. In terms of international relations, there is new data to look at regarding the role that women play in leadership and how these roles might influence relations between states. For example, are women more dovish when it comes to war or are they hawks who are just as likely as men to deploy troops? Are they different somehow in the way they oversee economic or trade relations between countries? There is also some vibrant research around how women can help recovery in post-crisis and peace efforts and interesting insights into how societies that promote gender equality confront international relations in general. Postmodernism and postcolonialism are also subsumed under the category of critical theory. Postmodernists theorize that humans will evolve to disregard the remaining pre-modern forms of authority that have not shed through industrialization and modernity. In other words, humans will grow to focus more on social and scientific critique as a means of improving society. Certain authors like Michel Foucault influenced these lines of critique of institutions and authority by asserting that truth was not neutral, but something manufactured by power. We believe what we are meant to believe by powerful people, in other words. 
Postmodernists and postcolonialists alike argue that resistance to these pre-modern forms of oppression would entail local, specific movements instead of mass liberation movements. Postcolonialism offers us the viewpoint that the ways we've envisioned our communities, including states, has been influenced by the colonial view of non-Europeans as exotic, as othered, and argues for a rethinking of societies and communities without these labels. Both postmodernist and postcolonialist focus on a new world order that is not dominated by Western or any particular belief system, but envisions an order that provides equality and opportunity for local entities to define themselves. A related tradition is normative theory, which challenges the steadfast assumptions of realists and their take on reality. From the standpoint of normativists, there is order in the world system related to its culture, and states have concerns that do extend beyond power. For example, states come to exist to protect human rights. Normative theorists identify the tension between cosmopolitanism and communitarianism. Should the focus be, as with cosmopolitanism, to create a larger human community, or to focus on local communities and the specific characteristics associated with the particular politics of the local? From the communitarian standpoint of human rights, there are no universal human rights, only the ones that are locally agreed on. This overlaps with the lesson about pluralist versus solidarist in the human rights dialogue. Should the solidarists and the cosmopolitans have their way and intervene to create a human community of the globe based on human rights? Or should the non-interventionist, pluralist, and communitarian approach be respected? The United Nations has not always agreed on which standards should be applied, but through the responsibility to protect, a norm adopted in 2005, there is at least one international norm that intervention is required when genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity, and aggression are taking place. How strictly the UN adheres to this norm, however, depends on who is violating it. Finally, another critical theory of increasing relevance is green theory, which mainly concerns itself with the role that environmental damage has on international relations and theorizes ways that international relations can design solutions to the world crisis. The critical element of green theory relates to the ways that power structures reproduce social, political, cultural, economic, geographic, and other inequalities between states. At the extreme, environmentalists propose interventionism to aid in creating a better environment for all. This concludes our discussion of international relations theory, but it has been necessarily truncated. If you find any of these perspectives interesting and would like to read more about them, feel free to email me and I'll be glad to give you more information or more readings.